So my name is still Jason Casey, and we are still talking about uh, <laughs> how to build up secure access with zero trust principles. So we, we, we just had a discussion uh, around the ideas that asymmetric cryptography, specifically used for digital signatures, could help us eliminate a lot of the problems uh, around um, uh, passwords and password vulnerabilities. So just so we kind of remember that, right? We were talking about um, what if we could use asymmetric crypto, actually cryptography, can't just say crypto now because that now means something else, specifically a digital signature, right? And so we showed that in our classic example, right? We had Alice talking to her bank, right? An access attempt, uh, the bank issued a challenge, right? Remember that challenge was just a random string and essentially the challenge is Alice proved to me that you can digitally sign this string uh, with the private key that I know you hold that it relates to this public key, right? So remember this bank has this database of public keys. So Alice will then complete that signature, provide that, we call that a challenge response. And then the bank can go through its standard verification step, but essentially it is just Remember, um, what came across was this payload, and this payload was essentially a random value, but it could be a random value with a bunch of other things as well. And it had a cryptographic hash of the payload, of the message written out. And then it had a signature, which is really just an encryption of this cryptographic hash of the message. And that had the effect of sealing the payload. And so what the bank is doing is the bank, remember uh, asymmetric crypto is really about keys that go two ways, right? So you have your pri uh, public key and you have your private key. And so I can use this as my encryption key and I can use this as my decryption key. So what they do is they decrypt uh, this encryption and that gives them essentially the crypto hashed value of the message. Then they compute their own crypto hash of the message. And then they compare these two things for equality, right? So in a nutshell, that is what's going on. And we said, hey, this, uh, when we're talking about a uh, surface area that we have to worry about from a, a password perspective, we have data in motion and we have data at rest. And we said, if we took this sort of approach, the private key doesn't have to move. Now, it doesn't have to move doesn't mean doesn't move, but it doesn't have to move. And by not making it not have to move, um, the motion problem went away, and the data at rest problem drastically shrunk. Right? But we didn't actually say, how are we going to, how are we going to guarantee it doesn't move? Right? And that's what we're going to work on now. So how do we guarantee this thing doesn't move? And for that, we're going to introduce this concept of a secure enclave. So a secure enclave is, it's a, you can think of it as a type of processor, right? Uh, you kind of have to think of it as literally its, its own little chip. And it may have a limited set of operations, right? The operations may be um, generate key pair, uh, uh, encrypt, decrypt, right? Obviously, you have to give it a, a key and some data stream. Uh, obviously, uh, delete key pair. And there's, there's some more operations, but let's just kind of stop there. So I have this little trip, we'll call it a secure enclave, and it has these operations. So it's not a general purpose processor, right? I can't, I can't do general operations. Oh, uh, and it has hashing functions on there too, cryptographic hashing functions. And we'll just, we'll just say it has a list of them. So um, I can send a piece of data to this secure enclave, and with a key, I can tell the secure enclave to encrypt that piece of data, right? Likewise, I can send it a piece of encrypted data 
And if the right key is there, I can have it decrypt uh, that data. So uh, one other interesting property about these enclaves is when you create keys, you can also add, you can create these additional properties of the key. Uh, and essentially, when we said this was a processor, we left out a couple things. This processor has some storage. It's a small amount of storage, but it ha and it's called secure storage. And the idea is, is it's, it's tamper resistant. So I can store things in that processor that no one can get at. So here's an interesting idea. So I have this computer, right? Uh, this is, we're back to Alice's computer. And you know, our computer's got the typical processor on it. But then let's say it also has the secure enclave on it, right, over here. I could create an asymmetric key in that processor. Um, and I could create it with the property that it has to basically stay in the secure enclave, right? So what that guarantees when I create it in that way is there's no way to actually copy uh, the key out, right? Um, so how do I use the key for this example? Well, the answer is I send data to the processor and say sign this data with that key or encrypt this data with that key and I will get back the encrypted stream, right? So there's a really interesting property here. And that property is if the key is created in a way that can't leave the processor, the key is never in memory in that, in that machine. If it's never in memory, it's also never in disk, right? So remember we said with the data at rest, I drastically shrank the problem, but I didn't really provide any structural guarantees that the key couldn't be removed, the private key couldn't be removed from Alice's machine. Well, if I create and I start to use secure enclaves, I can actually now provide those structural guarantees that number one, not only can the key not leave Alice's laptop, but the key will never exist in the most vulnerable portions of Alice's laptop. It's drives and it's memory. So things like memory attacks, cold boot attacks, all those sorts of things, they're not, they, they'll, they'll work at getting data off the file system and out of memory, uh, but they're not gonna work on things in the enclave, right? Uh, because they're actually in the enclave. Now, there's a lot of other interesting properties of the enclave that, we'll talk, that we're, we're kind of reserving to talk about in the next couple of sections. But if I really want to make gains uh, on authentication and drastically reduce the problem space, right? Because I, I would say, uh, you know, not just here at Beyond Identity, but engineers all around the world, really good engineers, the way they tackle intractable problems or what seems to be intractable problems is they change the rules, right? And, and we look at it as no different. If, if, if I have a huge surface area that I really have to worry about, right? Um, I could uh, build, build a mousetrap, right, and do all sorts of crazy things, and that's what a lot of us are doing. But if there's some way for me to shrink the surface area and then worry about protecting that much smaller thing, this is where I'd rather spend my time. So a lot of our engineering effort, a lot of our design effort is really about how do we change the equation to where the surface area looks like this and not like that. So the first step is to move from shared secrets to asymmetric crypto, which we showed in kind of this example. And then the next step is to use the secure enclaves that exist on almost all commodity equipment um, to, get, to, to, to really guarantee that where that private key lives is really, really, really small. So the last thing I'll talk about is um, secure enclaves. I'm sure you've heard about them. Um, you've heard about TPM or TPM2. You've probably heard about uh, the T2 chip from Apple. You probably heard about um, what is it, uh, trust zone uh, in ARM. And it turns out every chip vendor has a flavor of their technology. Not only chip vendor, but cloud vendors do as well. So AWS now has uh, an AWS instance called Nitro. And when you're running a Nitro EC2 instance, you can actually create enclaves. It turns out the other cloud providers have similar technology, right? whether it's uh, Azure, Microsoft, Google, um, and I believe Oracle and IBM uh, have similar. So since about 2016, 2017, consumer electronics all have some form of this technology. So 
Uh, in the next section, we're going to keep building up our example using asymmetric crypto and enclaves to actually work it into a more realistic authentication.